Good evening. What a treat it is to be here. My name is Chris Gordon. I am the Programming Manager for Readings and I'm delighted to have all of you here. But before we begin, I want us all just to take a little moment out of our busy day to reflect on how fortunate we all are to live in such a beautiful country. And of course, this country, which is owned by the First Nations, has not been ceded. And it seems to me that we're incredibly privileged to live in a land that we can make sense of through their stories and their song lines. At the moment, I am speaking from the Kulin Nation and I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. So, what a treat we have for you tonight. Of course, this night has been brought to you not only by readings but also by Alan and Unwin. It is, she, they are the publishers of Rebecca's book. But now, to be asking the sort of questions that we all want answers to, I am delighted to be able to introduce you to Alice as if she needs an introduction, as if she is not loved by every single person in Australia, as if this woman has not absolutely blown our mind with her writing, her kindness, her generosity and her ability on this very, very particular night to actually juggle a variety of tasks, to parent to be an author, to be an interviewer, to be someone's friend. Here she is. Alice, if we were in a reading shop now and you had your beautiful babe on your lap as you do now, the applause would be gentle but very affirming. Over to you, my friend. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for that delightful introduction. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all. Um, I've got my camera on at this angle because I might need to feed this baby during the night so you probably don't want to see anything below my neck. So um, it's, it's just such a delight to be able to, um, to be in conversation with my friend Rebecca about this book that she's written, Tiger Daughter, which, which I absolutely loved. Um, it hit me like a punch in the stomach, to be honest, when I first read it. And I couldn't stop thinking about it for days and days and days afterwards. And I'm still thinking about it to this day. So Rebecca um, also needs no introduction. She's a super mum. She's a superwoman. She's a lawyer. She's a writer. She's written best-selling books. And um, she's very prolific. She's written over 20 books. Uh, with three children, and her books have been nominated for every single award um, that you can think of in YA, the Children's Book Council of the Year, notable book for older readers, um, the Prime Minister's Literary Awards, the Indies Book of the Year Awards, that great award um, that's voted by young people, the Gold Inky Award, the David Jemmel Legend Award, the Science Fiction Award called the Aurelius Awards. And um, her novels have been translated into German, French, Turkish, Portuguese, Polish, and Russian. And Rebecca is, I'm sure many of you know, and I see a lot of familiar faces and lots of friends in this audience tonight. Rebecca is the co-founder of the Voices from the Intersection Initiative. So thank you so much, Rebecca, for having me read this book and be in conversation with you. It's such a big honour. So I think I'd like to start off by asking, um, there's this beautiful dedication from the very first page of this book to my son and daughters, each of whom I'm raising in their own image and no one else's. Can you explain that dedication to us? Sure. Um, I think that dedication just um, uh, indicates how much of a slack mother I am and that, that, that I'm not fulfilling the tiger mother role, unfortunately. In fact, the exact opposite. So um, I, I point to that every time with the kids and say, you should be really grateful about this. You should be really grateful you're going to school right now. Tidy up your room. So yeah, that's kind of what it's directed at, just being an anti-tiger mum, I suppose. Did you get to choose the name of this book, Tiger Daughter? 
I did actually, oh. although um, people have been yeah. calling it Tiger Girl, which sounds a lot more sort of funky and sexy. Um, I might go with that in another reprint or something. But, yeah, no, I did because, um, I mean, everyone will probably be familiar with that Amy Chua uh, book that came out a few years ago, The Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother. And yeah. I actually thought I'd like to write a response, you know, from the child's perspective because the people who come out of that kind of upbringing, they're either really, really broken, really rebellious, or, you know, they come out like this tougher, meaner, harder version of themselves, I think. Yeah, I, I love how you said that and you wrote it in an email as well that children from that kind of upbringing, and I'm sure some of us in this audience have had first-hand experience of that, that they have a like a, an edge to them, a, a, not a good edge too, a, a streak of um, the resilience makes them, you know, hard, as you say, and sometimes very... Or a bit brutal, brutal or a bit mean or, yeah, it, it's yeah. sort of... It, so it's kind of like reclaiming that concept for the child rather than for the parent and sort of taking that negative stereotype of the tiger bum and really turning it on its head. And this book was um, not like the title suggests. It's not about tiger parenting at all in the Amy Chua sense. Um, you know, the, the blurb is also quite <laughs> deceptive or misleading. Um, it's a great blurb. So I was expecting to read this book about these two Chinese immigrant kids who try really hard and um, go get into a selective school and the challenge is there. But the first third of this book, something, I won't give anything away, but something so, um, so traumatic and so awful happens. Um, did you find it difficult as a writer and even with your publishers and editors to write about uh, this enormous trauma that your character, Henry, experiences quite early in the book um it, it was kind of tricky because i i guess with this book i was trying to do a few things at once i was yeah. um, digging away at confucian philosophy which i think we haven't really sort of you know looked at properly for about 2500 years <laughs> and I've, i was also kind of um trying to speak to those you know migrant or refugee kids who are often trapped in a really unsafe environment at home and that might be you know something arising out of for example unkindness to the parents which then translates to unkindness in the home I suppose um, and in this particular case this is not something that happened in my family but it's a community story that I'm aware of that you know some people can be so driven by their despair that they'll do something drastic and irreversible and so what I wanted to sort of um, highlight was that kind of really breathless dangerous environment that a lot of kids find themselves in and how you know these irreversible acts can have ripple effects that you know affect you know so many people in the community and you wrote about it with such um sensitivity as well and um you know such a bleak act there's there's a kindness um that that the characters really have to work hard at and I think that's what makes the kindness more extraordinary. You have to work hard at it, you know. And when you talk about the unkindness in these households, Rebecca, I know you're not referring to just some mean words here and there, but a really virulent kind of uh, meanness. Uh, could you give us some examples of that from the book or from, you know, experiences with young people? Sure. Um, I think um, what I was trying to talk about, I guess, was, you know, often we talk about toxic masculinity in the yeah. um, in the sort of mainstream kind of about it in terms of surfers or you talk about it in terms of like, I guess, Caucasian families, but we never really talk about um, those kinds of um, power or control relationships in um, migrant families or refugee families. So um, what I was trying to sort of do with one part of this book was to demonstrate that, you know, that kind of stuff happens in these, you know, so-called model minority families as well. You know, from the outside, they look perfect. Everyone's working really hard. Everyone's keeping their head down. They've got jobs. Um, but inside those families, because you've got kind of um, intersecting, I guess, sexism or racism coming from outside, but you've also got that happening inside the house. It's such a suffocating environment to be in that you've got these like, you know, almost doubled or tripled layers of um, discrimination. And it is a toxic masculinity. There's no other way of putting it. Um, and I think, I guess it, it is an explored because if you're not from that cultural background, if you write about that, there's a danger of perpetuating stereotypes about uh, one of the biggest ones are Asian men, you know, that they have all sorts of negative stereotypes attributed to them. So um, your book is wonderful because 
you, you understand, you, you have a very nuanced look at that kind of toxic cultural masculinity. You know, it, it's not artificially imposed. Um, what I wanted to ask you about is Confucius features heavily in it. And do you think Confucius features a lot in the upbringing of Chinese Australian children today? It's a 2,500 year philosophy, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, even though we don't sort of acknowledge that it does, um, I think we really need to look at it because it's not a religion. You know, everyone's sort of sophisticated enough and it's far enough away from the start of it that we can actually say, well, there are bits of this that don't actually work. And so, you know, in, in a lot of Chinese families, it's just accepted that there are men's roles and there's women's roles and you don't really cross over and, you you know, you can't, you can't do a man's job if you're a lady or something. But um, I really wanted to look at that and, and just say, you know, taking um, things as spoken or for granted um, is a really dangerous thing because your culture never moves forward if you do that and there's never any space for girls in Confucian philosophy so if you read it and I actually have read it you know end to end now several times I think they mentioned women three times in that in that um, uh, the Analex so you know, it says something about lumping, I think, women in with servants and small mm -hmm. men. That's one reference. Another reference is be good to your mum and dad. And the third reference, I think, is, um, you know, where Confucius is talking about, you know, certain ministers of, of some state. And someone says, oh, well, one of the ministers was a woman. And Confucius says, well, you know, really, there really, really were only nine ministers then because one of them was a woman. So those are like the three references to women and that whole thing. And we've based a culture on that. So I think it's ripe for looking at again. Um, and really, I guess that aspect of it will probably go over the heads of some of the middle grade readers, I guess, because they're not looking for, you know, a critique on Confucian philosophy. They're looking for a story. But um, what I tried to do with each of those sort of um, epigraphs for each of the parts is to say, you know, these are some of the entrenched things that have led to, you know, men's roles and women's roles, and we really need to re-examine those. And there's, there's this... Um this wonderful but horrifying scene where the family are having an argument and the, the, the Confucianism that you portray in this book is a fundamentalism, isn't it? Because there's no other way that Wen can relate to it except to say that she's trying really hard to be the man, you know? Mm. And, um, and that's, that's not funny. I found it heartbreaking. Um, can you explain that? You know, in this sure. argument, she mentions about being a man. Yeah, because there's no other way to model yourself in that philosophy. So I think um, that the, the heart of the Analex is really, um, you know, you've got to strive to be the most kind, benevolent, educated gentleman that you can be. So if you're a girl, and like I was raised in a family just with women, how do you become the most benevolent kind gentleman that you can be? Like, you know, we can be as educated as possible, but we're never going to be men. But um. I think in a lot of families, you know, the women are expected to not only do well at school, beat all the boys, you know, get all the prizes, do all the music, you know, instruments they can, but they've also got to be a good wife and mother at the end of the day. So, for example, I mean, I joke about this all the time. My mother-in-law always reacts with horror because I'm serving up, you know, pre-marinated Coles chicken to my kids, but it's like something has to give here. I can't. I can't cook everything from scratch every single day when I'm working in a day job and writing books on the side. So, um it's that kind of thing, you know, what is a girl supposed to be within this philosophy if there's nothing to model herself on? And um, I, I don't mean to get personal, but and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, Rebecca, but do you feel that philosophy has a kind of impact on your own life, your own upbringing, um, the way you relate to, you know, <laughs> to your family? Uh, Were you brought up in a Confucian household? Yeah, I was. And I've married into a super traditional household as well. And they're superstitious to the point of, you know, you can't wear certain colours, you can't have certain foods if you're recovering from surgery. I mean, it's that minute. So, um, yeah, a lot of I bump up against stuff all the time. And I'm always sort of scoffing about all the invisible rules that I don't know about. So in each of the Chinese subcultures, there's like a particular set of rules that a good woman or a good man would have to follow. And um I've got two of them crossing over and I just can't, I can't meet any of them ever, I don't think. So yeah, there's often a lot of pushback. And um, I mean, it's not an autobiographical book, but there are certainly lived elements in it. So um, that's why like a lot of people have said, oh, that sounds really realistic. And it, it is really realistic because I can remember like a seven-year-old cousin of mine just screaming at her mother in Chinese and just saying, you are trying to squash me to death. 
This is a wow. seven-year-old. She had every kind of lesson under the sun after school. And in Singapore, this is where she lived, they mm -hmm. study from Monday to Saturday. So on the Sunday, she's saying, I can't believe I still have computer lessons, drawing oh. lessons, piano lessons, you know, all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's absolutely lived experience in there. That's that's awful. And um, it's, it's no... Um... It's not uncommon for children eight or nine years old to to um, kill themselves over this level of stress. Uh, you hear a report from Hong Kong or Singapore once every couple of months because I also have family in those countries. It's it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Um, it is really heartbreaking. It is, and when, you know, even adults yeah. do it. You know, kids have sort of reached the age of eighteen; they haven't got the right results, and you know, that's the end. They they can't see any way out. And that there is not a false note about the emotions in this book. And I love how you write about this um, terrible admixture of fear and rage that uh, Wenzel feels quite a lot of the time. Um, can you explain that? Sure. Um, I think my life is actually ruled by fear, uh, not so much by rage, often by rage, not as often as, as like in that family, but... Um, I think for a lot of migrants, it's sort of the fear of not being the same as everyone else or the fear of not measuring up. And the rage, I guess, is that unkindness I was talking about where, you know, the, the acts of an unkind person to an adult will then spill over into the family that, you know, lives under the iron fist of that adult. So, um, yeah, I think for a lot of migrant children, there's a lot of just uncertainty and it's those polar opposites of, is he going to be a happy dad today or is he going to be a volatile and violent dad today? So, um, that's kind of, yeah, where that was coming from. And I think, you know, the reason I'm so driven now as an adult possibly is that fear of never living up to anything or never getting things done on time or, you know, not being able to finish stuff. I still have the exam dream. I'm almost 50. So, you know, that, that kind of, I, why am I still having that dream? But, you know, often you'll just be like in a hall in your dream thinking, my God, I didn't study for that maths exam and it's right now. And it's like, why am I having that dream still? It's impossible. So, yeah, it, it's a really, I think a lot of kids feel that. A lot of kids feel that all the time. And a lot of adults, as you mentioned. Um, I, I often, you know, I think about that exam <laughs> dream. And and sometimes I have, that exam I have it. Dream. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's kind of sad, actually, to admit that. But um, it's better than the naked dream, like where, you know, everyone's looking at you and you're the only naked person. But yeah, the exam <laughs> dream's pretty bad. I've never had the naked dreams. I think <laughs> I've been lucky. How have you turned into such a wonderful, beautiful and generous person? Um, I don't want to go deep into your background in case it brings up terrible things, but from the sounds of it, this, uh, this is a very personal book. I can relate to it in a very personal way as well, having lost a close family member um, to, to depression because of these pressures you speak about and because of this fear that never went away. Um, I don't know. What makes a person <laughs> turn into Rebecca Lee? What has made you? I don't know, maybe the support of like lovely friends like you who say lovely things about me. I, I literally have not been, you know, like I've never, I don't think I've, you know, cornered any, you know, awards market or anything in Australia. So it's just, it's just having, um, you know, I guess for me, um, when I was at school, there weren't that many Asian kids at my school. And so um, my daughters are now at the same school um, 30 years later. And seeing the sort of shift in demographic has been quite amazing. And so like I had a really strong support network of female friends from back then and having, mm -hmm. you know, carried them all the way through to, you know, the age I am now has been really helpful. But the origin story for this particular book and the reason why it's so personal is that I literally went to my... Um, older daughter's year seven English parent teacher interview and they said hi here's your tailored book list for your daughter we've thought about this really carefully and at the, <laughs> stop, at the top of this book list was um the getting of wisdom picnic at hanging rock and playing beatty bow and I read all those books because those were my tailored books in year seven as well and I think I just felt like pure unadulterated rage that you know there was nothing <laughs> like your book your book your beautiful book Lorinda should have been on that list she's in year seven she could read that right she could cope with it or something by Maxine or you know something by somebody who isn't canon you know, like the accepted 80s canon of what an Australian writer looks like. Like a lot of the people in the room now, you know, like M, Siobhan, Leanne, like their books should have been on the list, but no. they weren't. Um, so uh, I think the one Asian story that was on, the Asian story that was on it was written by somebody else, like Leanne Hearn or something. So um, 
Yeah, it was just really rage. So, you know, rage and fear, I suppose I'm, I'm showing my true colours now, but, you know, fear motivates my adult life and, and rage made me write this book, I think. You know, um, we're, we're not considered literature a lot of the time, Rebecca, because people don't trust us. We're either faddish, you know, or, or we do the Asian Australian thing. This is a one book wonder, which is how I felt for oh, the past 10 terrible. years. And every new book that comes out, I think oh, I've lasted one book longer. <laughs> you know, the bandwagon might move away <laughs> from me. Even though I know you do the same, I know Leanne does the same, all of our um, writer friends who are not Anglo, do it. we put everything into our literature. And we try and write literature. We're not writing ethnic stories. This this book um, is literary. You, know, you craft every sentence carefully, I can tell. Um, but I don't know what it is with the, the Australian Book List Society or the teachers who put us on book lists. Uh, are we too faddish? Why don't you put, I don't understand why they don't put more writers like us on. You know? Possibly yeah. the reason we're not on that list is that we're still alive. So I, I don't know, maybe you have to be dead to be on that list. I'm not really, I'm sorry, I'm not saying that about Leanne Hearn, but I'm just saying <laughs> everybody else, you know, on that tailored book list was probably long dead. So maybe you have to actually die first before you can enter the canon. I'm not really sure. But um... I don't know because um, the lovely Melina Maqueda gets put on book lists with looking for Ella Brandy, which yeah, she is wasn't Australian. On that one though. That's the thing that really oh. frustrated me. And so that's why I thought just for this school and Leanne yeah. will know what school I'm talking about. I'm just going to knock one of those bloody books, you know, with the yeah. girl in a fluffy white dress in the bush off the list. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm writing it for you guys. And I think on the day of publication, I actually thought, yes, I've done it. So I wrote a letter to the head librarian. And I said, okay. if you could just give this to your year sevens to read in one class and discuss, I'd be really grateful. Thanks, Rebecca. And, you know, they're probably sort of hating me now for sort of getting in there and you know blackening their name everywhere but it's about time that we you know had something on the list that wasn't at least 70 years old you know for yeah. our girls to read and especially if that school now looks like um I think their demographic is at least 50 percent Asian or South Asian in senior school and about 90 percent Asian or South Asian in junior school um wow it's just criminal you know that okay. they don't have other things to read about um it's I don't want you to give away the school, but it's not a state school, is it? No. Because we're more likely to be put on the list in state schools. I, I find that a lot, you know. I visit a lot of state schools. Well, this is the funny thing. Like, I, I go to state schools a lot to speak, and, and literally the kids that I speak to are mostly sort of, um, you know, they're Tongan or they're um, refugee or they're from the Middle East or they're Indian. And I will say to them, I'm here to talk about the craft of writing, right? I've got three yeah. hours of stuff to talk to you about the craft of writing. And they literally say to me, we don't read. It's not interesting. We do beat poetry. We do slam poetry. We rap. You know, we do manga. We make animation. You know that kind of stuff. So yeah. they're like, I don't want to listen to your three hours of material on the craft of writing. I just want to read you my journal. And I'm like, go for your life. Read your journal yeah. because you know that's something more immediate to them. It's that's them so putting their stories into a way that you know makes sense to the rest of their friends and is a way to engage with each other, right? So often, like I'll go to schools and they'll be like, don't want to talk about your books just want to talk about you know my stories that make sense to me in the language that makes sense to me so yeah it's kind of depressing like you know there's this disconnect between you know all the stuff in our libraries and then our kids who aren't reading it anymore because they've got something more immediate to you know deal with that speaks to their experience so yeah yeah that's so true there is such a disconnect um and also between the private and public school divide too isn't there um mm. yeah yeah and you, you mentioned a great point about the, the families that you expect your family to be a safe place, but often in a lot of immigrant families, your family is the last place you want to be in during lockdown. It's not a safe place. <laughs> it's a place of great pressure. Yeah, yeah. Yep, and I feel absolutely. for those kids, if you've ever done, you probably have done Zoom sessions last year with certain schools where you know, <laughs> all the rooms are white walls because the houses are too embarrassing to show. They don't have bookshelves. 
and the, the kids look um, browbeaten because they're at home with their parents yelling at them all the time. Actually, it was interesting because some of the schools that I spoke to, the children were not allowed to be on screen because, you know, people didn't want to be judged about their home environment. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, for I a lot of them, that. like I was either speaking into a link and I couldn't see anybody or I was pre-recording it and then they just yeah. sort of, you know, they'd, they'd look at it at their own time. So, yeah, it was a really, really dangerous period last year. Like um, one thing I really noticed because I play a lot of, um, this is really sort of dangerous, but I play a lot of nerdy, in fact, um, computer games. And yeah. so, like, I noticed during COVID that, you know, all the COVID advertising and all the mental health advertising was in English. But then you got to the domestic violence advertising and it was in every language under the sun, Indonesian, <laughs> Western, Chinese, you know, because, um, you know, these are kids' games. And so they're saying to the kids, if you're feeling unsafe, bring 1,800 respect, right? But it's in yeah. their language. And, I, like, I've never seen an advertising campaign like that before, and that was happening a lot last year. Wow. Oh, that, that's so, that's, that's um, disturbing, isn't it? It's Gosh. disturbing and really sad. Like, you know, the fact that they're targeting kids yeah, through these apps. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd like to get back, go back to your book. Um, and the re these characters have a certain resilience about them. And it's not the two-dimensional resilience where everything works out. They have a dogged pursuit of happiness even though they have no idea what joy is. I think you mentioned the word joy four times in the book. Um, it, it's something they're striving towards. They, kids, these kids have an innate sense of what matters in their lives. And it's not the, you know, twin feelings of fear and anger. It's, it's this elusive thing called joy. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I think for a lot of kids, um, you know, especially in a dangerous situation, you fixate on something that you think will bring you happiness. So yeah. I think for the two of them, they kind of fixate on, you know, passing this selective um, exam, because maybe that will be the way that they bring joy into their lives and control and agency and all the things that they're missing. So um, it's probably not a really realistic, um, you know, view that they hold, but they kind of hang on to it because it means that maybe if they pass through that gate, joy will be on the other side of it. Might not be immediate, but they'll get it one day, that kind of thing. So yeah, that's that's kind of that that sort of elusive mention of joy that keeps coming up because it's so absent from their lives. Every day is so tentative. They're just not sure what's going to happen next. Yeah, I, I guess another word for that is that they seem to have some degree of hope against um, all odds, you know, <laughs> everything stacked against them. For, for pursuing their happiness was um, you were writing for a middle school audience and I found that very surprising because I read this book and I thought, okay, it's for 16-year-olds, but what, what is the um, age bracket that middle school is? Going back to that origin story of rage yeah. again, um, I've got yeah. a, a daughter who's 14 now and I've yeah. got a daughter who's 11. So when I started this, um, one of them was nine and one of them was like 12, I think. And so I was trying to write to that, you know, that sort of cusp of YA, but mostly middle grade where they're moving from, you know, primary school where you don't have to worry about anything technically to senior school. Um, and so I was aiming it at that daughter who didn't have anything to read you know, that was closer to her lived experience, but also aiming it at the um, the other daughter as well. And so I had one of them illustrate Henry's pictures and one of them illustrate Wynne's pictures because um, it's such a formative age. And like to be growing up in that situation where you're just terrified all the time, you know, and it's so unpredictable. What does that do to you? How does that shape you? So it was just interesting because like, um, and even that sort of, you know, the tragic event, which we won't really talk about in there, um, it was interesting because my um, the then nine-year-old said, don't have a problem with any of that. Mm -hmm. And then my older one actually said, oh, that's pretty graphic. I don't know if you should go into that level of detail. So um, yeah, it's really interesting. Like, I think if you approach the story as a middle grade reader, um, yeah. you see different things in it that, than if you approached it as an older reader. So both your daughters were your early readers, Rebecca? Yeah, to the point where they're like, I'm not reading it now. I've read it 50 times. I'm not reading it again. So I gave them a copy and they were like, yeah, great. And like, yeah, I was like, look, look, your picture's in there. Look, they look really good. And they're like, yeah, whatever. And, you know, they've moved on to something by Patrick Ness or, you know, something more exciting. But, um, <laughs> yeah, they were they were the early readers. And they kind of found it quite claustrophobic because they'd be like, oh, I recognise that. Oh, I think, yeah, I, I recognise who that's based on. So, yeah, they... Yeah. They found it a bit too close to home, I think, for them. Wow. And, and um, your nine-year-old read it and she was fine with it. So kids, she was students are more resilient. Sorry? 
Yeah, she was completely fine with it. And in, to the point where, like, my publisher actually, and this doesn't happen that often because I, I often don't fight um, edits. Like, I'll just say, as long yeah. as you haven't, you know, damaged the meaning of this sentence, I'm not going to fight you on every word. But yeah. um, they actually pulled back um, that sort of that moment a lot because I had the right. reactions of adults around that thing happening um, in yeah. too much graphic detail. And so the publisher said, you're going to freak out the younger readers but it was really interesting because yeah my younger child went no nah, no problems with it and the older daughter went exactly the same way the publisher did and said that's too much you have to pull it back I wonder if your older daughter had been reading so many books that have been written by adults and edited by adults that she was used to certain tropes about how a certain that kind of story should be told um I watched a good film last night nothing to to do with your book but it was a Korean film called Minari and you know the grandma sees a snake and the boy wants to throw a snake at uh, throw a rock at the snake so the snake would disappear and the grandma says look don't do that because it's better that you see the danger than not see the danger you know the our fears are magnified when we don't see them they could be anywhere so you, you've exposed something and maybe that's why your nine-year-old wasn't afraid. But they can handle much more than we think they can, hey? Yeah, I think it's true. They, they are really resilient. And, yeah, this is writing to those resilient kids who just feel like, you know, there's there's nothing that looks like me in the stories that I'm being given at school. And, you know, this is sort of like a celebration of their resilience, I think. It's, it's a beautiful celebration, Rebecca. And um, the, the drawings are very joyful. And the book ends... Um, it ends Wonderfully, I'm not going to give away the ending, but you write a few pages at the end about who you wrote this book for. And can I just read out these lines? You know, you wrote it for these children. I really hope it speaks to you and to the children in your lives who are processing and grappling with the same big issues that we are. And you wrote that, you know, that you see them. It, it's for them. And, and it's, it's such an important thing to be seen, isn't it? It's really vital because, I mean, you probably were there in the era of the Babysitter's Club where there was the one Asian <laughs> character, but for me there yeah. was like literally nothing. So, like, I, you know, went on, like I've said to people before, to read Buck Rogers when I was really young because, you know, there was, like, nothing else I really wanted to get into. And it's really sad when you're sort of driven out of one genre into another because you just don't see any stories about people like you. So not that, you know, sci-fi and fantasy is a sad genre and I'm really proud of being a genre writer, but you're right, it's not literature, it's, it's genre fiction but I'm very proud of that. Well, you know, you should be proud of this wonderful book as well, Rebecca. I think um, Chris says it's almost time to wrap up our Q&A and can we open it up for questions, Chris? And can we celebrate ready? what an amazing job Alice is doing? Like, I, I can't even, like, when I had a baby that age, I could not even string two words together. So it's incredible that you can actually do this and look after the baby at the same oh, time. Oh, she's not that, she's just um, small in size, but she's four months, so she's, she's pretty <laughs> easy now. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Rebecca and Alice. There is one question from Roy, and he's wondering, Rebecca, what did you do to maintain that focus on the upper MG reader? Um, I think because I'm, I'm literally immersed yeah. in the world of TikTok, like all the time. I've just got, <laughs> you know, she's now 11, right? But I've got her shimmying in my face nonstop and like all her friends and they're always on Zoom and you walk in with an apple, you know, to give someone and they're all there on the screen looking at you like, you know, your mum just walked in and they're, you know, singing or whatever. So I'm, I'm immersed in MG at the moment. I can't get away from it. And um, yeah, so that, that's why I like just being around them all the time and the language and the stuff. It's like, look at this cat video. It's like, do I have to look at this cat video? I've seen it already. And like, you know, this guy singing in his underwear and it's all there all the time and I can't get away from it and like you know like she's doing dance classes she's doing ballet classes like this constant like this MG world you know like is in my face all the time so that's why like you know I never feel like the child is very far away for me because the child is never very far away they're literally standing there <laughs> when I'm on a zoom going can I have some cheese and you're like there's 26 people on the screen can you just wait a minute so yeah that, that's that's how you just sort of immerse yourself in the in the day-to-day -day and that sort of that's the language overlay and the, the feeling of being young I suppose and also for me I guess as a as a migrant kid with lots of really formative experiences, that stuff is never far from the surface as well. So I kind of often contrast the way that I was at the same age with the way that they are now. And they're so much more confident and, you know, sort of life savvy than I was. Yeah. 
I agree with that, actually. Uh, I've got a question here from Simone, our wonderful Simone. Hello, lovely Simone. Yeah. Uh, she is saying to me, she's wondering how hard it was to switch from the supernatural to the realism, especially when writing hard stuff. And did you have to change your writing process? Okay. Um, like the, the way I like to characterise this, I think, is that um, you've got someone who's an outsider. And so that's the same for both my genres, I suppose. Um, you've got some outsider with extraordinary abilities that they didn't realise they had. So in the paranormal genre, you've got, you know, people who can fall out of the sky and kill people with their bare hands, but they don't start off that way. They kind of come into their power. Um, with this one, like I had the outsider who literally looks like she has no power, no agency. And through, you know, small acts of kindness, she builds on that, you know, ability to be empathetic and to be kind and to sort of make changes in other people's lives. So I think in that sense, the characters are not that different. This one was a lot more difficult, I guess, because it is mining the personal. And so, you know, you're going, I'm skating really close to stories about people who are still alive. Um, how do I do this respectfully without being untruthful? Um, and you're meshing it all together and you're hoping that people don't recognise themselves in certain things and think, is she judging me for being this way? Or, you know, that, that kind of stuff was really tricky. So I think for this one, the process of writing was a lot more layered and a lot more careful because how do you explain Confucian theory to a nine-year-old? I mean, they, they're just not interested. They're like, what are these epigraphs? Like, why is she putting them in the front? Let's just move on. But I'm kind of building in layers there for the teachers who are talking to the kids. This is why her house is the way it is because of this kind of stuff. And we'll explain a little bit about that later. Um, but it's also about sort of negotiating real stories like just being really careful because in fantasy anything goes you know people are flaming hands they can you know you know do whatever they like they can fly they can you know but um in in a sort of like fairly realistic story you just can't you know you can't have the deus ex machina like none of that stuff can happen <laughs> um, much as you would like something to come in and save her that can't happen so you've got to exclude all the machinery that you would ordinarily use from this kind of story and that's the difficult part i think in writing a realistic book Oh, thank you so much for that answer. This is our, our final question, Rebecca, and it's from Danielle Vinks, uh, loved by Hello, all. Lovely, authors. Danielle. Uh, she's asking what authors you are reading, what you read growing up or as an adult, that it make you feel finally seen. And I think it's such a, a, a terrific question to end up on. Yeah. Um we are really, really fortunate now because I think we are starting to see, you know, the floodgates beginning to open uh, with stories about diversity. And so, like, just during COVID, I was really, really lucky to read um, a series by Liu Chi Sin, uh, which is called The Three Body Problem. So it's a sci-fi book, but it's about what makes us human, especially if we are humans living in deep space. So it's like this whole kind of space philosophy about, you know, what makes us human and what makes us empathetic if all of the stuff that we are anchored to is no longer there. Um, so it was just amazing to read that because like, even though it was translated into English, like I could get into that Chinese mindset straight away because the way that he said things or the way that he expressed stuff, I thought, oh yeah, you know, that, I understand that. Um, and, you know, just books like, I mean, I talk about Amberlin's book quite a lot, but, you know, living on stolen land, like being able to understand, like once you read a really, really simple, beautiful primer on why, you know, First Nations people need to have a voice to parliament, they need to have more control, you know, what it feels like to have a whole mob of people come and live in your country and never leave. Once you kind of get that perspective, it changes the way you look at everything. So. Right. Just seeing stuff like that, you know, that's really opened up, I think, the conversation a lot. And we have beautiful writers, you know, um, from, you know, every walk of life starting to come through. So, you know, we've got Carly Findlay's um, anthology just come out. We've got Anita Heises's, um anthology that came out. Um, Ellen Van Nieben's Throat. You know, all these things are sort of speaking to Australia as it is now rather than Australia a la picnic at Hanging Rock. Um, so I think it's a really wonderful <laughs> time to be alive, you know, because we actually are starting to see, and Danielle's helping that too, we're starting to see these perspectives come through and it's really important. I, I thought that was such a tremendous answer. Thank you so much, Rebecca. To you, Alice Pung, thank you so much for asking the questions uh, that we all wanted the answers to. I guess what struck me listening to both of you is the humility that both of you have and the generosity in both of your spirits. And uh, on behalf of all of your readers and on behalf of all of your fans, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to see a little bit of who you are. And 
more importantly, why you are. Uh, to you, Rebecca, best of luck with this extraordinary book. Thank you again, Alice, for juggling and juggling and juggling as women do and as women have done. And to you all for joining us out there. Go well into the night, my friends. Talk about this event. Spread the word over and out. Good night, everyone.